welcome Moto UNSF participants and PS4 staff. Today you will follow a lesson about the experience of representing the United Nations as a resident coordinator in the DPRK, North Korea, delivered by Mr. Jerome Savage, a former resident coordinator. Thank you, Jerome, for preparing the presentation and kindly accepting to hold this lesson for us. This lesson will be followed by a brief Q&A. Jerome, please start when you're ready. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with all of you um, to just share my, my experience um, as representing the United Nations uh, in North Korea. I lived there for three years and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit later about what it's like to live in North Korea. And really my, my focus is the lessons from, from the field, from the ground, um, practical experience uh, that, uh, that I've had for these three years. Um, the presentation outline will be the following. First, I want to focus on what do you mean by the engagement? When you are the resident coordinator in any country, you need to understand what your engagement will be, what the United Nations will engagement will be in a given country, whether it's North Korea or elsewhere. Secondly, from that understanding, you derive what I call seven functions uh, of the resident coordinator system in a country. Third, I try to discuss the question whether cooperation between the UN and the DPRK can be improved. Fourth, I will quickly talk about living in North Korea. And five, a word on model UN um, strategic framework and youth engagement as Bada and all of you are, are doing, which is very interesting. First, the UN coordinator must correctly assess the nature of the crisis um, in the case of North Korea. I want to insist that there are assets in North Korea. Um, first, it's not the great famine of the 1990s when North Korea opened up and people discover, discovered what had been the situation. Secondly, it's not a failed state. I have in my long career with the UN dealt with countries that could not feed their people, guarantee their border, or guarantee their security. I can assure you that North Korea regime can ensure the security of the people and more, actually, um, to, a, to an excessive point. So that's not a failed state. It's important to understand the distinction between a failed state and a, and a state that has the capabilities that the DPRK government has. Also, there are markets, the famous Jan Madan's market, um, which are a factor, uh, uh, an asset in the society. There are the human capabilities. The Korean people are extremely capable, uh, competent individuals uh, in their own right. And that counts just as much for North Korea. Finally, North Korea is placed in the world's fastest growing regions. China, Japan, Mongolia, South Korea, etc. It's at the center of that fast growing region. Having said that, there are liabilities. The populations live in permanent insecurity. The agriculture is chronically insufficient. And we can discuss the word chronically later. The health system is essentially collapsed. There is no longer a resilience among the people in terms of their ability to sustain a blow uh, such as uh, the weather, for example, a tornado, a, a cyclone, uh, isolation of the country, sanctions by the international community are also liabilities uh, for the country. And finally, the human rights situation. So when you have taken those elements, and I'm sure there is more of them, this is an example, you have to then ask yourself, as the UN coordinator, how will I engage all of the UN system? And that's my second slide. I would say there is perhaps seven dimensions to the role of the UN, the UN system in North Korea. There is, of course, a political role that deals with the UN Security Council and the Secretary General. There is the humanitarian role, of course, that we know about. There is a human rights dimension, which I will discuss later. There is the data issue. There is development, as in long-term development, aid coordination, 
And finally, one we forget sometimes, this is the normative role, the rules, the international rule in health, in civil aviation, et cetera, et cetera. I will take each, this will become my framework for this next, next session. So we can discuss each of those element in the engagement of the UN system in North Korea. Next slide, section two, one, political security council and the secretary general. My job was also to keep informed the secretary general and the countries that were interested in North Korea. I can imagine, you can imagine there is a lot of them. In my case, my secretary general was Ban Ki-moon from um, South Korea, who was very interested in briefings. So of course I, I had his ear and I could speak to him directly. But many countries around the world want to hear the briefing of the resident coordinator, telling them what is the situation there. You do arrange high level visits, uh, Department of Political Affairs, OCHA, embassies, NGOs, because they need to have an entry point and it's often the RC system. You try to be a bridge, a small bridge, between the five permanent members of the Security Council. I'm sure you know who are the five permanent members of the Security Council. Um, France and England are the least important one, uh, France and the United Kingdom, but the three others, United States, China, and Russia, two of them have a border with North Korea, and one is the United States. So I can assure you that these three members of the Security Council want to know what is happening in the DPRK. And since there is little information, the resident coordinator is one of the sources of information. My job was to brief the international community. I was going in all different capitals from Seoul to Tokyo, to Paris, to Washington DC to brief members of the international community as to what is going on in North Korea. And of course, with those countries, you do fundraising for the UN agencies. Since they listen to you, you go and you ask for money. Next slide is the humanitarian dimension. I've taken just a few examples to show that human development in North Korea is going backwards in a region that is speeding forward or upward. I've taken on the left column, East Asia, minus Japan for the sake of statistics, and on the right column, the DPRK. You see two, two human development indicators, maternal mortality and life expectancy. On maternal mortality and life expectancy, I've taken the year 1990. Why? Because it is the apex of DPRK when it was still being helped by the Soviet Union, which as you know, collapsed and uh, uh, the Soviet Union disappeared and became Russia um, at that point. So we're taking 1990. Well, in 1990, maternal mortality indicators were roughly the same in East Asia and North Korea. But in 2018, the last data before COVID, Maternal mortality had dropped to 27 deaths for 100,000 births in East Asia, whilst it had gone to at least 82 for 100,000 births in North Korea. So you see this sudden gap um, in uh, a matter from 1990 to 2018. Same with life expectancy. In 1980, they roughly had the same expectant life expectancy. In 2018, life expectancy, by in 2018, life expectancy had shot up in South Korea, Ch even China, and in many countries of East Asia, whilst in DPRK, it was at 70 years, and that is the official statistics. It may be much lower as far as we know. So again, you look at the humanitarian situation in a context of a region, and you see a drop of one country when the whole region is going up. Next slide. I, we can discuss it later during the Q&A, but the humanitarian engagement, you know all about it already. I can see in the UN in your in, uh, Peace Corps, um, food, nutrition, vaccination, 
emergency health, essential medicines, water and sanitation, renewable and renewable energy, agriculture. The people that we met knew that there was aid coming from the international community. They were aware of it. The people that we met, um, there's many a North Korean had no idea that there was international community helping them. We need to be very careful. But those that we met in the farms and the schools knew that we were the United Nations. Um, that is just the point I wanted to make on, on, on this uh, on this call. Next uh, slide number eight, the UN and the NGOs are providing very little money to North Korea in reality. We are talking about over the past 10 years before COVID, approximately 22 to $30 million of aid, about $4 per North Korean. That is way below uh, what you see in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's a lot less money, but it is big enough and specific enough to save lives. Um, and that is very important to remember. Um, that medicine, that food, um, this training, uh, all that support did save lives of children, of mothers, of people who were um, very much suffering from, uh, from the new Mediterranean situation. But again, it is tiny. Um, as I said, um, my, my, my data here showed 2018, they asked for $112 million and they received $22 million. Well, it is, it is very, very small uh, for any developing country. The third dimension of the resident coordinator's job was the dimension of human rights. I am moving to the, to the slide called 2.3, and it is will be a bit of a case study. My question is this, can on the ground engagement by resident humanitarian and development agencies help improve human rights in North Korea? After all, it's not an obvious proposition, uh, as we can imagine, given the well-known humanitarian situation in the DPRK. Next slide. It is a tough context to raise human rights in North Korea. Um, first of all, it's unusual. Humanitarian agencies traditionally avoid mixing politics with aid. We have learned that it's not helpful for us to bring up human rights when we want to bring we need the cooperation of the government to deliver the aid. It's complicated. The field agencies must already navigate a complex sanctions regime caused partly by human rights concerns. It's very risky. Past representatives in DPRK and elsewhere risk to be persona non grata, uh, meaning kicked out of the country uh, for raising human rights issues with the government. And it's vague. There's never been a clear mandate for the UN resident coordinators as regards human rights. It's improved lately with the role of the UN Office of Human Rights. It's a little better, but it's still quite vague. Next slide. Having said that, agencies cannot ignore North Korea's human rights dimension. In DPRK, it is difficult to dissociate politics from aid. The ambassadors, the missions would query our actions. They would say, what are you doing with human rights? Um, the, um, the agencies um, in the DPRK uh, must therefore ensure that aid does not promote the suppression of, of human rights. Uh, the risk of diversion of aid, uh, the, the issue of right to food, for example, if food is diverted, you are effectively um, uh, perverting uh, uh, and preventing uh, uh, that particular right. The agency's executive boards and joint agencies to provide direct assistance to the people instead of capacity building of the state, partly out of human rights concerns, meaning they do not like to see UN agencies build the capacity of the state, which is itself under sanction. And they say 
we would like the UN agencies to provide direct assistance to the people instead of building the capacity of a state which they criticize for its human rights concern. So as I said, it's very difficult to avoid the human right dimension. And after all, and that's my slide number 12, the UN presence offers real entry point. Um, UN is a paradox of size versus significance. I've already explained that it is one of the smallest aid programs worldwide in comparison to other developing countries. But in North Korea, there are no large and, 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 and multilateral aid program. There is no World Bank, IMF, Asian Development Bank. There is no formal European community presence. No EU, the projects are implemented by European teams, but not the European Commission. The UN aid covers the whole country. And the whole UN system keeps North Korea connected to the rest of the world in many ways. Um, General Assembly, regulations, climate change, etc. So the question is, as the resident coordinator, how do you turn this relationship into specific results? linked to human rights. Well, first you have to ask yourself, who can I work with? And that field-based engagement uh, can be with the people in the North Korean government who understand the need to stay within the UN club. Now this is controversial and some people disagree, but I believe that members of, some members of the North Korean regime and government wish North Korea to stay in the UN club, wish to participate, and are prepared to do what it takes. Those people anticipate material benefits to the DPRK if they make progress on human rights. They are willing to advocate for engagement with the UN in competition with the regime's security system, the military, or the party. This is the belief that in DPRK, you have competing centers of power, the military, the party, um, the security system, and the government. And some of these people are advocating for a greater participation on the international sphere. And for that, they have to advocate to the top level uh, of the government, to Kim Jong-un himself, and that's their job. So that's who a UN agency can engage with, okay? Slide 14, field-based engagement, what are the entry points? Well, obviously the DPRK has signed UN human rights conventions, such as the Convention on the Right of People with Disability, CRPD, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and others. So one thing to do is say, hey, you signed those conventions, Let's, let's make them work. And secondly, the famous human rights-based approach in programming, the framework of the sustainable development goals based on human rights and the rights of France initiative from previous UN secretary generals to better coordinate between UN agencies, separate approaches to development, peace, security, and human rights. I'm gonna give you three examples of how we try to operationalize this, our work in a human rights uh, framework in North Korea. One, we took the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability and we organized a consultation on the benefit of CRPD with the National Kore uh, Korean Federation of People with Disability and with Handicap International, the NGO. We included disability component in the trainings of UN professionals, including national members, North Korean members. We had UNICEF, UNFPA and WHO jointly develop a curriculum for national health professionals working as community doctors and added protocols for health and rehabilitation of persons with disabilities. And finally, we inserted, inserted eight questions on disability in the 2010 census, which was done by UNFPA with funding from Switzerland and South Korea. Now, there were challenges. In truth, the mainstreaming of disability rights in UN programs is limited to this day. 
but it was a step forward. Second example, data and international reporting. We use data by, we try to increase data transparency. As you know, data in North Korea is a black ball, impossible to find. If you push for more transparency, this is a, the, it is, it was a, a factor for improved governance. We pushed for data gender disaggregation and we obtained it. Nowadays in North Korea, much more of the data and information is gender disaggregated. In 2011, the government of North Korea issued its first SDG reporting, at the time it was MDG reporting, which openly discussed inequalities. I witnessed personally how much advocacy this took by members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of DPRK to convince other parts of the regime to publish this report. Unfortunately, and that's the challenge, the UN agencies at headquarters were reluctant to accept the report from North Korea due to the lower quality of data and analysis than in other countries. And I was very sorry for it. I think we should have told the DPRK, well, okay, it's a step in the right direction. Let's accept this report. Anyhow, it was not. Um, the DPRK produced in 2021, the SDG Voluntary National Review Report, which I must say still does not meet international standards, but it shows that there is, in my opinion, a group of people in the North Korean government who want to continue to push towards greater uh, transparency and who do it at great personal courage. And the third example of progress and challenges in promoting human rights is in the field of women's reproductive rights. We were um, able, UNICEF, UNFPA and WHO in the areas of child and maternal health and advocacy for child rights um, to support the establishment of a comprehensive monitoring system and education for all in North Korea. The program was successful, but more in addressing sexually transmitted disease or cervical cancer control than in advocating for a broad choice of contraceptive methods or by showing how to support women's rights and full participation in the workforce. So it was a limited uh, success. Um, so we should not fool ourselves uh, that you only can do small steps. What is the way forward in, hum in human rights uh, work in North Korea? Well, we have the last UPR, the UPR review on the universal, universal Person, uh, review on uh, DPRK of May 2019, uh, which produced 262 recommendations. Uh, we have an ongoing dialogue well, not now with COVID, but just before COVID uh, began, there was an ongoing dialogue with agencies when in 2014, DPRK accepted to dialogue with UN bodies and the resident coordinator to quote, improve the human rights situation in the country and with humanitarian agencies to ensure their free and unimpeded access to all populations in need so that humanitarian aid is distributed transparently and reaches the most vulnerable citizens. Of course, these are declarations uh, that the job of the resident coordinator is to make them become real. My next slide shows how the UNDP are, the UNDPRK strategic framework links for the first time in 2017, development, peace, justice, and good governance through SDG 16. You all know that probably even better than me now. The UN strategic framework in 2017-2021 said there will be a human right-based approach to address any inequalities and to reach the most vulnerable people, groups and region of the country. You go down to the SDGs and the National Development Goal, which has the SDGs applied to DPRK, the SDG 16, which was promote societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build the accountable and inclusive institutions, translate in national development goals, in turn the whole society into a large and harmonious family through strengthening of people-centered Korean-style socialist system. So you see, there is still in the language a, a big gap 
uh, between the two, but it is again a step in the right direction. And the targets of the NDG, therefore the North Korean targets are, and I will only read 16.7, ensure that people take an active part in state administration and socio-political activities, fully exercise their political rights as masters of the state and society at all levels. Again, it's a target, it's a declaration, um, but it is how we're trying to operationalize human rights uh, uh, in concrete term uh, in the field. My next slide is of course to recognize the limitations in realizing HRBA and SDG 16 and NDG. When we say to reach the most vulnerable people, groups and region of the country, how will the UN agencies reach street children, homeless people, persons held in detention centers and prison labor camps. Um, it is, it, it will, this is the really, the reality of how we make it work. Or when the SDG targets say, ensure that people fully exercise their political rights as master of the state and society at all level. Do they mean election monitoring? Um, these are the questions that come to the fore when you're looking concretely at what it means to link human rights um, to the uh, DPRK NDGs. Moving on, and my fourth function of the um, resident coordinator is the importance of data. I remind you that data is the fourth item in the UN strategic framework, uh, data and development management of the DPRK. So it is extremely important. You see, if you see the, president, the PowerPoint presentation, this is a typical map issued by the UN to show where are the program, in this case, I think it's nutrition program, where they are located on, in which uh, counties and REs and provinces uh, of the DPRK and which agencies are doing it. That is based on data. Next slide, data collection is done by the UN. I would really say pretty much the only data coming out of DPRK is by the United Nations. Um, and, and so, you know, it is what it is, but there is no other source. Uh, some example of data collection, I'm sure you, you know about them. The crop and food security assessment, uh, very important. It is when um, the United Nations, uh, usually the European Union, always other countries are joining, Australia, um, the United States has joined in the past, other countries have joined to really assess the food situation of the country. Very important, very important uh, source of data. In health, of course, the multiple indicator cluster survey mix, which gives us a photo of the health situation uh, of, of the country. And there's many more. I should remind about the population census, which was a huge achievement in 2008, in which for the first time, we again had an overall vision of the population of North Korea. Uh, South Korea funded it, Switzerland funded it, and it was absolutely fascinatingly interesting. And uh, as an anecdote, when I presented it um, to, to a, a panel, there were members of the military, North Korean military, who came to listen to the, to the presentation. They were very interested. So, you know, you can really see they don't have data uh, themselves. Uh, and so how can they base policy? How can they measure anything without um, the data to monitor it? Of course, under information, and we'll talk about it later, you have two major documents of the United Nations, the needs and priorities, which started in 2012, and the strategic framework uh, that you know all about. Fifth in the functions is the development. As you know, development means long-term development, uh, usually to build the capacities of a country and the national capacities of the country. And very often that goes through the building the capacities of the government, building the capacities of NGOs or the private sector. Uh, in the case of North Korea, <clears throat> there really is very little development work. Um, first, because Capacity building means often transfer of technology and transfer of advanced technology is not allowed by the international community. 
uh, due to the sanctions. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the, um, the transfer technology uh, is essentially suspended by sanctions. Uh, we can talk about it later. Sometimes it goes a little too far. Uh, once we wanted to get filters for seeds to separate the seeds from big seeds to small seeds. And uh, the sanctions committee said, well, you can use these, these filters for nuclear purposes. I don't think so personally, but anyway, um, it was very difficult. You have to be very careful with the equipment that you send. Um, so UNDP was the main agency for de long-term development and it shifted its program to aid that directly benefited the people outside of Pyongyang. Um, and we, we tried not to do capacity building at the central level, capacity building of the government. I, guess I put two photos here. On the left are small um, wind turbines that you put on top of people's houses. Doesn't cost anything. I mean, cost like maybe $250. Uh, and um, people were able to have that ab above their houses and uh, they could uh, charge their phone. They could charge a, a, a radio or charge a, a VCR. Um, and of course, have a little bit of electricity. And they really enjoyed those small uh, electricity turbines. And it was really direct help to the people. And on the right, you see the plastic sheeting that covers the, the, the crops. Um, as you know, the North Korean winter tends to go very late. And as a result, um, uh, even in May, it gets very cold. And therefore, people, um, you need it to cover, to cover the seeds. Aid coordination, that's number six of the RC function. I'm gonna show you what I call the noodle dish of the UN system. Go to the next slide, number 26. That's your noodle dish. In, West, in, in Europe, I can, for the Europeans, I call it the spaghetti dish. For the Asian people, I call it the noodle dish, but it's the same. It's very complicated. And if we go to the, uh, well, it's very complicated because there is all these funds all these organs, all these specialized agencies that are all having a role. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that the poor little resident coordinator has to hold all these, all these agencies on, on like this. And it's totally confusing and they have no idea what's going on. And you're supposed to coordinate all these people. Um, not very simple. So let me go to slide number 28, which is the tools of aid coordination. Very simply, and if you want, we can talk about it later in the Q&A, but you have the UN country team, which is the agencies. You have the cluster system, which is putting together the UN agencies, the NGOs, the bilateral aid, and try to coordinate on a theme, health, education, emergency. And then you have these documents, like the needs and priorities document that list what it is that we want to do in this year, what are the needs, what is the fundraising and the money that we need for it. And here is a photo of the DPRK needs and priority document on tw slide 29. Slide 30, this is the ask, you know, total population, people in need, people targeted, the money that we were asking for, how many partners, and a, and a photo with the amount where there is need uh, uh, on the province. So this is a typical example of a, of a, of a, of a document by the UN. Uh, requesting requesting for funding. Slide 31. In DPRK, um, aid coordination in 2012 had started in 2012. And uh, there, oh, the UN strategic framework that started in 2012 in DPRK. And there was two goals to coordinate internally the spaghetti dish or the noodle dish of the UN agencies try to get some coordination in one document and agree on what we're going to do. And secondly, external coordination with the government so that we can try to do a plan together and with the rest of the international community. Slide 32, just made a photo of the, of the document, but I think in the UNSF in your group, you do a lot of that. So I will not go there too much. And finally, seven, the seventh role of the UN in North Korea are the normative functions. When I say normative, I mean norms, I mean rules. Um, for North Korea to fly a plane, they have to respect the rule of 
the International Civil Aviation Authority. For North Korea to receive weather information on cyclones, they have to obey the rules of the World Meteorological Organization. To send a letter, you have to obey the rules of the Universal Postal Union, etc., etc., etc. These agencies, these normative agencies, anchor North Korea to the international community, make that they're not completely isolated because they have to participate in this international or they will not fly a plane, they will not send a letter, they will not participate in cultural or historical program. So this has an important role uh, if you're a member of the United Nation. Okay, I'm moving on to the third question, which was, can the cooperation between the UN and DPRK be improved? I only have five, six bullet points to say, for me, the UN can be a possible broker, a small broker, but a possible bridge or broker between the parties. Try to hear what the North Korean government is saying, go and say to the United States, to the United Nations, to other countries, see if you can play that role. Secondly, you need to negotiate very hard every day for the standards of international cooperation. As you know, in DPRK, it's very difficult to have access. They don't want you to go to one province or another province. So we use the principle, no access, no aid. If we cannot have access to monitor, see the situation, make sure that the food or the medicine has been delivered there, we cannot deliver aid in that, in that province. But it's a battle of every day. Every day we fight because uh, otherwise, you know, boom, the window closes, you need to reopen the window. You need to reopen that door every day. Every day is like that. Uh, for example, to give you a ex concrete example, we would say we have to be able to go to a, pro to a province like this whenever we want, just to visit, to check that the food, is, the aid is delivered. And they would be, well, we need 12 hours, we need 24 hours. Then we think, well, did they just bring the medicine from somewhere else, put it in the closet to look like they have the medicine? No, we need to do on the spot survey. So that's a kind of monitoring dispute that are the reality of international cooperation. I see the role of the UN to report the situation to the outside world. I call it witnessing. We witness, we say, this is what's happening. The good, the bad, the suffering of the people, the suffering of the families, um, the, the, the impact of the sanctions, everything. We produce the data, I've already said that. We try to demonstrate what is donor transparency. We try to show um, the best standards of international cooperation. Um, and we try to empower the people through the projects. We have to work through the sanctions, banking, procurement, licensing, it's very difficult. When you wanna buy a computer, you have to go all the way to Washington DC to get their approval uh, to buy a computer because it's technology. Um, and finally, you analyze that you support uh, you want to support the part of the North Korean government that wants international cooperation. And I've given you a possible book to read if you're interested called Inside the Red Box, which believes in the competing theory of, as I said, the military, the party, the government that compete for decision making by, by Kim Jong-un um, and, and the, by the top level of the government. So that's how you improve cooperation, everyday fighting, everyday discussion, everyday engagement. Okay, living in North Korea. Uh, these are photos I'll just show you quickly. On the left is my wife. She was an, she's an American citizen. She was the only American citizen living in North Korea. And uh, she, um, she was, uh, we had a little balcony and we could grow the food. And um, she had, a, a, in the office, she grew food in the office. It was very interesting. Uh, she would discuss with North Korean the best way of, this, of growing food and so on. Um, on top is a photo of me showing the biscuits. These are the typical World Food Program biscuits that are distributed to school. Um, and we would visit those places. And down below is visiting the DMZ, uh, but on the North Korean side. And what you see here is the UN flag. I remind you that 
in the Korean War, the UN at the time was fighting North, was fighting the North, fighting China and Russia. Um, the UN was really had chosen one side. And for a long time, the North Koreans did not forget it. Um, when the first UN people arrived in North Korea, North Koreans were very suspicious of the UN because they remembered that the war had been fought under the banner of the United Nations. So a lot of, uh, lot of better memories about that. So we lived there for three years and uh, we traveled almost every, in many, many places, almost everywhere, uh, climbed many of the mountains of North Korea. Um, it was very nice to be with the international community. We made friends, um, but not always a lot of North Korean friends. We could not go to their houses, um, but we made friends, you know, where we could meet in, 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 at the office or in restaurants and places like this. You can ask me a question later on if you're interested when doing the Q&A. This is uh, for the South Korean. This is kimchi making by the office. Uh, every day uh, we had the, the uh, I'm sorry, every um, about October, uh, they would dump a huge amount of kimchi on, at, at our office and everybody worked for the whole weekend to prepare the kimchi uh, that we ate. And then we, 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 we prepared it. We put it in big, big, big vats, buried them underground, keep it underground. And that's what people ate for the whole, uh, during the whole winter. Uh, These are wonderful times um, of memory. And this was the best when you have it like this fresh. Okay. Uh, next one is travels. I'm just showing photos of travels. Um, we traveled in wonderful part of the country, but unfortunately we also had to visit uh, orphanages and we saw children who were uh, in very, very bad shape. Um, those little guys that you see on the photo are probably probably three years old. Um, so completely undernourished um, and um, way, way below the growth, uh, the normal growth rate. Um, we watched, we saw the agriculture. Uh, these are the people, this is in May, you're replanting the rice. And so everybody goes out there. There's even music. Some there's a band that goes out to give you energy. <laughs> and these people are planting the rice in cold, cold water because in May it's still very cold. Um, and then you see on the right, deforestation is very bad. People want to grow food everywhere, everywhere. And so there's no trees and it's another problem. We visited the health system, which has completely collapsed. And you see here uh, a typical hospital. Uh, there's no water. Um, there is no medicine. There is the no women give birth without any um, any painkiller. Um, there's no aspirin. There's nothing. Um, and these people still do their best. Um, you give them a, a book of, of whatever, some medical discipline. They will read it. 400 times. They know exactly what is in that book. They do their very best. That's what I mean about the capacity of people. The transport is really antiquated. On the left, uh, when there's a hole, they come, they put some dirt, they do tap, 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 tap. Then there's another rain and the holes come right back. And on the right, you see a truck. And I thought they were eating barbecue on that truck. No, 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 it's actually putting grass and grass to make the truck go forward. It's a very antiquated form of transportation. And to the question, when you're in North Korea, are the people friendly or not friendly? Well, this was our team. Um, it was a great team. Um, but when I left, I knew that I would never speak to any of them ever again, um, even whatever the level of friendship that I had. Um, so. It's complicated. Model, and that's my last point, model UN strategic framework and the DPRK. I think it's wonderful what you're doing, start putting together the framework of the UN strategic framework, the SDGs, applying it to a country. Now, it's fair to say that the UN work in North Korea is not fully replicable to other countries because it has certain limitations. One, 
there is no private sector in North Korea, not official private sector. There is markets and so on, but you cannot work with the private sector. There is no real national NGOs. Uh, and normally when you do development work, UN work, you look for the NGOs and that's who you're trying to work with, the government, the private sector, the NGOs. So that's some limitation, of course. And another dimension is, of course, is governance. When you work in, in a developing country, when you're a UN person, you deal with governance. You help the government and the, and the NGOs and the political parties to, be, to work better. In North Korea is very limited. So you will learn a lot in your work on UN strategic framework and North Korea, but you have to remember some dimension you will not do much that's for another country. Finally, the model UNSF and DPRK has to me a high potential because you can explore the SDG framework in depth. Um, everything is high intensity. Um, when you talk about human rights issues in North Korea, high intensity. Um, when you're talking about the position of North Korea in the world, it is the world's most strategic environment. Uh, read nuclear and risky. Um, when we think about hotspots around the world, we're thinking, you know, India, Pakistan, traditional rivalry. We're thinking right now the war in Ukraine. We're thinking um, uh, some spots where there is fear for, ten for tensions. Well, DPRK and the region, China, Russia, ROK, USA, Japan, that is a high strategic environment. So that's very interesting. And the UN role is relatively more important in North Korea than in many other countries. I mean, I was in India for a few years. In India, we're tiny. Nobody cares much about the United Nation. They're a big country with a lot of money, with you know Asian Development Bank, the IMF, and, and, and the country itself has a lot of capacity. So the UN, uh, uh, you, you play a relatively more important, if you will, more strategic role than in other in certain other countries. I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Jerome, for um, such an amazing and insightful lecture. Your life in North Korea was also very interesting. At this point, we would like to invite all of our participants to join the Q&A session. Um, please raise your hand virtually and we will unmute you. And Ishidora, will you lead the Q&A session for me? Okay. I would like to ask a question. Um, I'd like to know why have has the DPR's engagement with the UN seemingly backslided? Um, I understand that UN agencies have left the country. Uh, so I want to know, do you see a UNCT returning to the country at some point in the future? I think I'll take that question right away because um, I see there's some question in the chat as well uh, from Clemence. Um, yes, uh, Fergus, um, absolutely. Um, um, the um, I can tell you that um, the UN fully intends to come back. I, I am, not, by the way, I'm retired. I'm no longer at the UN, uh, but I, I know it. I spoke recently to the resident coordinator. Uh, the UN is, the UN team um, is, uh, of course, reduced. Um, they left. Okay, so they started to leave when uh, DPRK fully closed its borders, as you know, um, in, uh, in uh, 2019. Um, sorry, in 2020, when uh, in March 2020s, they started to go down. And then North Korea made uh, the border closing absolute, um, really total. And so eventually, uh, my, my friend, I have an Eritrean friend who was the last guy of the UN, the IT guy, and he left the last one in 2021. Everybody was gone. Um, North Korea was very, very strict about its uh, about COVID. They know that the health system is in bad shape, and they know and they feared that if COVID took over, it could be a disaster. Um, the UN team is currently in Bangkok, which is the regional center of the UN uh, for Asia, and uh, they're ready to go. 
And I am certain that they're quietly discussing with the DPRK authorities when they can come back. Um, and they will have to make an assessment, see the situation and, and see, see what's going on because really they don't really know. Okay, so uh, my question is, um, at the very start of the presentation, you mentioned that North Korea is not getting as many funds as uh, other regions, other developing regions from the UN or NGOs. Why so? Um, good question. Yes. Uh, the donors want certain guarantees and they don't get them. They want guarantees of uh, transparency. They want to be sure that they understand um, what what is uh, what, what what where the aid is going. It's very difficult to be clear to give them good reporting. Um, the, as I was saying, our monitoring is is good, but uh, it's not easy to come back with photography with stories. Uh, so one, the donors are uh, skeptical. Some donors will not uh, aid North Korea so long as uh, the tension uh, with on, on the peninsula continues. Um, many, many of them decide that uh, no, uh, frankly, uh, um, it is not their priority. Um, it's a political dimension in many countries. Um, I live in the United States and uh, there are, a government that gives aid to North Korean people, even if it's really directed to the people, to the women and the children, can get in big trouble uh, at the political level between the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, and, and, and I know because um, uh, one agency, UNDP, was closed in 2007 as a result of a congressional investigation into UNDP because the, 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 the government, no, sorry, the, the, the congressional investigation, the American congressional investigation felt that there was not enough control by that UN agency. So, you know, donors, donors are not sure. That's basically the, the that's the reality. Hi, you can hear me, right? Sorry, Jerome. My name is Isidora. You can see it down there. Thank you so much for this. Actually, I actually have a very specific question for you. Um, you have briefly mentioned about, uh, of course, we're all aware of the issues regarding collection of data and processing the statistics. And as it is important to us, it is important to them with the boots on the ground. I was uh, curious to know with regards to limitations of technology, in which ways were the data samples um, collected? Are we still doing it manually? Were you able, or if you know, like to use any devices, how up to date they are? You have any information on like if they were using any certain softwares to process that? It's just curious. Okay, so for the CIFSAM, uh, crop and food assessment, um, you use a combination. Um, the European Union is involved and therefore they bring in satellites. Uh, photo, um, which uh, show areas, and, and there's a complex, I, I don't understand how you do, but you, you look at certain field and you say, okay, uh, field X that was taken for a sample has that kind of uh, amount of corn quantity or corn, uh, intent, corn density, um, and, and they, they use that to, to extrapolate to the country, one. Two, on the ground data collection for CIFSAM, World Food Program and FAO, European Union and other bilateral donors send about three teams across the country. And they go and they go to these spots that they have identified and they really ask questions. For example, uh, you know, uh, go to a farm, a typical farm, and they ask, what's the protection, uh, production level, production number? They really, really, these are specialists, agronomists and so on. And they know if the people are trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Then there is the data that the government provides. The Ministry of Agriculture has data. Of course, they're trying to say, oh, it's been a very bad year this year. You know, please, <laughs> really bad. So all this you put together and, and they come out to, to, with, their, with their information. Health, well, you know, UNICEF is, is very good at gathering the data. You know, the middle arm circumference of the children uh, and so on. And so, yeah, it's, 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 you got to be on the field to go to gather your data. Um, to, and then there's a lot more. I'm giving you only two or three examples. 
Um, the census, that was an incredible uh, effort. It was a time when North Korea was a little bit ready to open up. And so they were able to go. But just a last point to say is, you know, on the CIFSAM, the rule was you have to let us stop anyone in the street and ask them, when is the last time that you ate protein, an egg, a bit of chicken or something? And the rule was that you have to let them, uh, let us speak to anybody, uh, which made the DPRK <laughs> partners very nervous. <laughs> There's a question from Clémence uh, Bernard. Did living in the DPRK for such a long time change your perception of the country? Yeah, uh, totally, um, completely. Um, you, well, well, you connect with the people inevitably. Um, you know, the, 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 you go to any country, you guys are all travelers, I, I can see that and you discover the people and you make friends and you understand their needs and people all want the same thing. They want fairness. They wanna be able to take care of their family. Uh, they want to, to grow, um, even the North Koreans. Um, but I've learned certain things. Um, a North Korean, in my opinion, wakes up every morning and thinks, okay, what am I gonna do for my duties? Um, and, and it's, it's good and bad. Um, they transcend themselves a little bit. You know, I'm going to, I have duties today for my block, for my farm, for my, my, uh, and, 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 and the second thing is the second question they ask is how am I going to feed my family today? So to me, these are the two things that they, that they have in mind. Okay. I'm going to take a question from Dil Dilan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, sharing all of this with us. Uh, I saw in the notes of the presentation that you mentioned that your secretary, uh, her perspective on gender changed and she became more conscious about this. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on this? I'm interested in um, like what the experience uh, was. Yeah, uh, it was very interesting. She was a bright, very bright person. Um, um, and and uh, you know, and you need to have a, a, a gender focal point. Uh, so I said, okay, you're going you're to be the one. And she knew nothing about gender issues. In North Korea, gender issues the, the, is believed by the, the authority says, it's been taken care of 10 years ago. We're equality men and women, uh, which we know it's not the case. Um, you will not find a single woman. That's not true. There's a few high level people in the government, uh, but on the whole, um, there are big issues of equality, of gender equality between the North and the South. Um, but it's a communist country and therefore there is a tradition of, of, of more equality, I would say, coming from, from the, the ethos of the, of the country. Um, but anyway, so I, I met her and I arranged for trainings and so on and information and she really became more aware of the issues of gender. And so when she had to go, uh, because her husband was uh, reassigned somewhere else in the North, uh, she, she said, well, that's not fair. My career matters as well as his. And so there was this whole, you know, and I was happy to see that she, she was beginning to think along terms of, you know, gender equality and so on. Um, Milena Milosevic. Okay, thank you so much for your lecture. I had a question. Um, so have there been any instances of clashes between human rights, humanitarian and development goals, given that human rights are often perceived as political and the humanitarian aspirations of neutrality and partiality? And the second question is with regards to development, because you said the UN did not want to adopt the approach of capacity building. So what was the angle they took? with regards to development and development goals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, there was no clash between um, uh, human rights and humanitarian because um, there was nobody working on, directly on human rights in North Korea. Um, I've seen elsewhere big clashes uh, between uh, the humanitarian community and human rights uh, uh, communities, really. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. You're absolutely right. We, we, the humanitarians slash development, tend to clash with the human rights folks. 
Um, we said, you guys, you, you, you know, you, you're not, you're not real. Um, we need, we need to give time, you know, we need to work with the government. And they're like, no, if it's wrong, it's wrong. So now through the SDG, I must say, I find that there is a, an effort to, to, to get a little closer. But so the answer is in this case, there was no issue. What I've shown to you in my presentation on human rights was really pretty much all that we did for human rights uh, in the DPRK. Um, on development, well, there were basically was, I mean, the development part was say in health, training of nurses, training of doctors uh, by WHO, by UNICEF, uh, that's training, that's capacity building. Um, what we could not do was uh, a study tour. It was very difficult to organize study tours abroad, uh, send a group of North Korean officials and tell them, show them what the world is like, how it's being done elsewhere. And I feel that's development, that's capacity building, and that should be there. Unfortunately, it was very, many donors would not support it. It was something they were worried about. And, um, uh, and so the, the DPRK also was, was all worried about sending people abroad. So it was uh, something that was not so easy. So UNDP, instead of development, did what I've described, those direct aid to people um, such as renewable energy, for example, um, or helping a farm uh, with its seed production. And then it was up to the North Koreans to replicate what we had done in one farm or in one village. It was up to them to replicate it. And that you could say would be development. In Nigeria, here in Africa, most people are not aware of the situation in North Korea. I started talking to people about the happenings in North Korea and they seem to have no idea about it. Is there anything that the UN is doing in countries like mine, Nigeria, to ensure that common people are aware of what's happening in North Korea. Uh, you're right, um, um, Sa Saeed Mohammed. Um, you, there is, um, there, there's, it, it's not, it's not the case. Um, no, Nigeria is a country of uh, um, 180 million people, I suppose, uh, enormous, uh, with in, in enormous challenges, and um, to an extent, you're right, it's very far. And um, there isn't much uh, that we can do other than uh, probably continue to speak in public, uh, inform the world about the dimensions, the very special situation in DPRK, and uh, probably um, that's about all we can do. Yes, thank you, Jerome, to share your great experience and insights. Mm -hmm. I, I also hope our participants could learn a lot from this lecture. Um, this lecture will give us a good understanding of how the UN system works within North Korea and what resident coordinators do. So thank you again, Jiryeong, and thank you. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you everyone who joins this lecture. Hope to see you all in Moro UNSF conference. Thank you. Bye-bye and good luck.